Welcome to Cinematic Excrements. Much like those assholes who park their SUVs in compact spaces, bad movies are everywhere, and most of them rather unremarkable. But every once in a while, a bad movie comes along that is truly special. Something that just tries so hard and clearly has a lot of love and effort behind it, but just fails spectacularly in all the best ways. Movies like Birdemic, or The Room, or Jupiter Ascending. Or the subject of today's review, Pan. Released in 2015 and directed by Joe Wright, Pan is an origin story of sorts for Peter Pan, based on J.M. Barrie's classic tale of the boy who wouldn't grow up. And for some reason, this prequel is set during World War II, even though the original play was first staged in 1904. So the prequel somehow takes place after the original story was written. Seems like they're playing fast and loose with the rules of time here. And we'll get to more of that in a bit. The screenplay by Jason Fuchs, and just by saying his name, this video is probably getting demonetized, was on Hollywood's Blacklist in 2013, which is not as bad as the name would suggest. The Blacklist is an annual survey started in 2005 of the most liked screenplays that have not yet been produced. This actually puts Pan in some pretty good company, as Best Picture winners Argo and The King's Speech previously appeared on the list. Pan, however, is not The King's Speech. The King's Speech is generally regarded as a great film and was rather profitable. Pan was neither great nor profitable. With a production budget of $150 million plus another $100 million for marketing, Pan only managed to bring in $128 million at the box office. And that's worldwide. This made it one of the biggest box office bombs of 2015. And it holds a 27% on Rotten Tomatoes. Oh, well, clearly that's why it failed, because as we all know, if a movie fails to make money, it's never because of its quality or its marketing or limited mass market appeal or anything like that. No, 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 no. Clearly, it is a critical aggregation website that is to blame for all of Hollywood's woes. Shame on you, Rotten Tomatoes. Shame. On the other hand, maybe, just maybe, mind you, there's something else that's to blame for Pan's failure. So let's take a closer look and see if we can figure out what that something is. But we all know it's really Rotten Tomatoes. I'm going to tell you a story about a boy who would never grow up. But enough about Donald Trump. But this isn't the story you've heard before. This is basically an Elseworld story. To truly understand how things end, we must first know how they begin. This movie provides no greater understanding of Peter Pan's story whatsoever, so I have no idea what the fuck she's talking about. Anyway, our titular hero, Peter, played by Levi Miller, is a boy who was apparently abandoned by his mother as a baby. So already this bears little resemblance to the original story where Peter ran away from home the day he was born. Granted, the idea of a newborn baby running away from home, or indeed running anywhere, is inherently pretty silly, but keep in mind this is a story about children who can fly after you sprinkle some glitter on them, so suspension of disbelief and all that. Peter wears a necklace with pan pipes because even his fucking name needs an origin story apparently. He also suffers from some form of dyslexia, but it only applies to English. As we learn later on, he can instinctively read the language of the Neverland Fairies. Percy Jackson! <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, I'm getting over a very sarcastic cold. And he spends most of his time hanging out with his best friend Nibs. As I'm sure many of you are aware, Nibs was one of the Lost Boys in the original story. But if you were hoping this would mean this movie's Nibs would be a major character, I'm gonna have to disappoint you. When Peter goes off to Neverland, Nibs gets left behind, and Peter doesn't come back for him until the end of the movie. Weak. The orphanage is run by some ridiculously over-the-top villainous nuns. If they had mustaches, I'm pretty sure they'd be twirling them constantly. And seems more like the Oliver Twist workhouse than an actual orphanage. They make the children do all of the work, especially if it's dangerous. Get on that roof and clean those filthy gutters. Is it safe, Mother Barnabas? All the necessary paperwork is in order. Should an orphan perish in a fog? Jesus, lady, just do your maniacal laugh and get it over with. You know you want to. And they hoard all of the tasty food rations while the children are forced to eat... whatever the hell this is. They don't even get their weekly serving of bacon anymore. Well, what is even the point? A life without bacon is not a life worth living. 
So you may be wondering how exactly does Peter end up in Neverland? Well, strap yourselves in for this one. Apparently, the nuns have been selling the orphaned boys to the Neverland pirates who pick up the boys at night in their flying pirate ships. Boy, howdy, do I have questions. And no, not about the flying pirate ships. This is hardly the first Peter Pan story to feature such a thing. I can let that go. Hell, I'm not even going to question how they're able to go into space and somehow not asphyxiate. Maybe there's some kind of magical barrier around the ship holding the air in. Maybe they're just really good at holding their breath. Don't know, don't care, not the problem. But I would like to ask, how did this bizarre business arrangement get started? Did the pirates just show up at their door one day with a chest full of gold and say, Hello, sisters, we'd like to buy some orphans, please. And the sisters were all like, Of course, you strange flying pirates. Take as many boys as you need and go with God. How did this conversation go down? I'd really like to know. And how are the pirates able to constantly snatch up these orphan boys without being discovered? In fact, when they snatch Peter, they are discovered by the RAF. But it seems like this is the first time this has happened. I know they're doing it in the middle of the night, but there is a war going on. How is this the first time they've been spotted by either the RAF or the Nazis? And how have none of the children spotted them? Have the nuns been spiking their drinks to make sure they sleep through the night? And why aren't the boys more suspicious of the fact that some of them keep disappearing during the night? They do make it clear that the nuns have been spinning a story about them getting adopted by Canadians or something, but are the boys seriously buying that these adoptions are happening during the middle of the damn night? Come on now. Anyway, the boys are flown to Neverland, which looks pretty awesome. It's complete nonsense, but at least it's creative nonsense. Upon arrival, they are conscripted as slaves in the minds of the pirate Blackbeard, played by Hugh Jackman. And I kinda dig his performance. He seems to be one of the few actors that's aware he's in a complete mess of a movie, so he's just having as much fun as he possibly can. Welcome to Neverland! I am acting! As explained by Smee, played by Adil Akhtar, the children have been brought to the mine not to dig for gold or jewels or mithril, no, they're looking for something else. Fairy dust, otherwise known as Pixum. Pixum. They call it Pixum. I assume because it was the best nonsensical word they could trademark. But the silliest thing about the pirates is not the ridiculously named Pixum, nor is it Hugh Jackman hamming it up to 11. No, it's this. Your ears do not deceive you, and you are not going mad. Well, okay, it's possible you may be going mad for unrelated reasons. I don't know you, you know, I don't know what's going on in your life right now. But anyway, that's between you and your doctor. The point is, the Neverland Pirates and the Miners and even Blackbeard himself are all singing Nirvana's Smells Like Teen Spirit. Talk about playing fast and loose with the rules of time. We're supposed to be in the middle of World War II, and they're singing a song that won't be written for another 50 years. And if that's not enough, later on they sing the Ramones' Blitzkrieg Bop. I swear I am not making this up. Hey, ho, let's not. Now you might be wondering how these pirates could possibly be singing songs that were written by people that haven't been born yet. The answer is, Pixum's a hell of a drug. That's only half a joke. Pixum actually is a drug. It's some kind of magical cocaine that Blackbeard snorts to keep himself from aging. And I'm wondering how much magical cocaine I'd have to snort for this movie to start making sense. So while most of the miners are children, because Neverland apparently has no child labor laws, there are a few adults as well, including not yet Captain James Hook. In the original story, Captain Hook was supposed to have been Blackbeard's bosun. But in this movie, he's just some jack-off mining for magical cocaine. Also, he's from the American South. Because why not? You just got here on a flying pirate ship. Real should be a very fluid concept for you right now. Are you talking to Peter or the audience? Hook is played by Garrett Hedlund with a southern accent that sounds so phony that for the longest time I assumed he was a Brit pretending to be American. Imagine my surprise when I found out he was from Minnesota. 
By the way, this is not the first time he's been on my show. He also played Murtag in Aragon. And he was apparently offered the role of Finnick in Catching Fire, but turned it down. So you agreed to star in Aragon and Pan, but you turned down the Hunger Games? Sir, you don't just need to fire your agent. Your agent needs to be shot. He also reportedly turned down the role of Christian Grey, but who didn't? Peter eventually gets into trouble because he's an arrogant little shit, which is actually pretty true to the original story, so I'll give him that one. And he and some of the other misbehaving boys are thrown to their deaths. This is a kid's movie, right? I think I have his horse. But somehow, when Blackbeard threw Peter at the ground, he missed. I'll be darned. His lips clearly said, I'll be damned. They'll show children getting murdered, but they'll censor a minor swear word? But yeah, Peter can fly. Granted, he's not very good at it. I can fly! <laughs> One of these days, I will get tired of that joke. Today is not that day. And oh dear god, that CGI is terrible. And why did you use CGI in this scene? Why didn't you just put him in a harness and hang him in front of a green screen? Hell, most of these shots are poorly chroma keyed already. Why stop now? But believe it or not, that's not the worst CGI creation in this movie. The worst is the Neverbird. Sweet sassy molassy, what am I looking at? This isn't just bad CGI. This looks unfinished. As if I'm watching a bootleg DVD made from an early version of the film where they hadn't done the final rendering yet. But no, it's legit. This is the actual Netflix rental disc. How did this happen? Was this intentional or did they just not finish the effects because they ran out of time or money? And the damnedest thing is, I saw this movie in the theater and I do not remember it looking this bad. Maybe it looked better in 3D? Maybe I was drunk? No, no, I wasn't drunk, because I distinctly remember wishing I was. Anyway, Peter forms an alliance of convenience with Hook, and also Smee, because someone has to play the comic relief sidekick, and they escape the pirates and find the natives. Now, here's the thing about the natives. They are the pirates' sworn enemies, and the two factions have been at war for some time. But the pirates have never been able to find their hidden base. Peter and company, however, were able to find it quite easily by following one of the pirates' own maps, which clearly marks the tribal territory. Now, pardon me, Mr. Blackbeard. Captain Blackbeard. Sir, but if you were trying to find the secret tribal base, did it ever occur to you, and I admit I'm just spitballing here, I don't have nearly as much experience with piracy as you do, obviously, so please, stop me if I'm missing something, but did it ever occur to you that you just might find the hidden tribal base in, oh gee, I don't know, tribal territory? Good God, you have got to be the dumbest pirates in the history of ever! How have you not found the tribal base? You have an armada of flying ships, and the tribal base is decorated entirely in pastels. They are not being the least bit sneaky. How have you not been able to spot this? I'm pretty sure this thing could be seen from outer fucking space. And now we need to get to the elephant in the room. And by elephant, I mean white lady. This, ladies and gentlemen, is Tiger Lily, a Neverland native played by Rooney Mara. I'm sure I don't have to tell you this was a controversial casting choice. In fact, the depiction of the natives in this movie isn't just controversial, it's confusing as all hell. For such a small tribe, they are somehow a pretty racially diverse group. In fact, Tiger Lily's father, the chief, is an Aboriginal Australian. How an Aboriginal Australian sired a white girl, I have no idea. Now, here's the thing. In most versions of the Peter Pan story, the Neverland natives are typically depicted as Native Americans. And in J.M. Barrie's original story, this depiction was racist as shit. The tribe was named after a racial slur for crying out loud. In fact, most depictions of the Neverland natives are pretty damn racist. And yes, that includes the Disney version. So now that I've ruined your childhood, I totally understand why the people who made Pan wanted to steer away from that depiction. 
But this? What even is this? No, seriously, what even is this? What is that thing you are wearing, girl? It looks like your head got stuck in a piñata. Anyway, it seems like the filmmakers were so determined to not be racist that they went out of their way to make the natives not resemble any individual existing culture whatsoever. But the end result is just plain silly. So. Much. Pastel. Why pastel? Why piñata hats? Why trampolines? Oh yeah, Hook gets in a trampoline fight with some guy, just in case you thought this movie couldn't get any sillier. And again, I get why they went this route, and I'm glad they wanted to be more racially sensitive. Although they still cast a white lady as the main character, so swing and a miss. But anyway, I get what they were trying to do. But I am not at all convinced it was the best route. Surely there must have been a way to depict the Neverland natives as Native Americans in a way that is still respectful to their culture. And it's not like Native Americans have an abundance of movie roles to choose from as is. Could someone throw these people a friggin' bone here? I don't think that's asking too much. Anyway, the natives eventually realize who Peter is by his necklace, and over time they reveal his mother's backstory through something called a memory tree, and also through the mermaid's waters, which are charged with memories. Because you can't just have someone tell him the story, no, no, no. In Neverland, even the flashbacks need a mechanism. Blackbeard and the fairies have been at war for a long time. Mary was once Blackbeard's girlfriend until she was discovered by the fairy prince when he snuck onto Blackbeard's ship. The fairy prince is never given a name for some reason, so we'll call him... Chad. Anyway, Chad and Mary instantly fell madly in love despite their considerable size difference. See? Size doesn't matter. And Blackbeard was all like, Girl, what you doing with that fairy? You belong to me! And Mary was like, Bitch, I never loved you. I'm out. And she ran away with Chad, who turned himself into a human, because fairies can do that apparently, and they made sweet, sweet love. And then he died. Oh, he wasn't killed by Blackbeard or some disease or anything like that. Oh no, his death was totally of his own doing. For you see, when fairies become human, they can only live for one day. Because reasons. So, if I understand the story correctly, Chad turned himself into a human, knowing that doing so would kill him within 24 hours, just to get laid. I guess that human pussy was just too good to pass up. So Mary got herself some ninja training from the natives, and after Peter was born, they decided to hide him in England. Good a place as any, I guess. And not only can she do some crazy gravity-defying parkour shit while carrying a baby under her coat, but she can also teleport. After putting Peter in the basket, she takes about 10 steps away, turns around, and poof! She's instantly right back where she was. According to IMDb, this movie had two editors, plus another 33 people in the editorial department. You'd think one of them would have caught that! So why did they hide Peter? Well, according to some sort of prophecy, he's their savior who will one day return to Neverland, defeat the pirates, and lead them to freedom. And that's basically what this movie boils down to. A lame, chosen one narrative. They think you're their messiah. And his mother's name is Mary. Subtle. Oh, you know what? I haven't even mentioned the most ridiculous thing about the Neverland natives. The pirates eventually pull their heads out of their collective asses and find the hidden base. And during the battle, I kept seeing these weird explosions of pastel-colored dust. And it took me a while to figure out what was happening. Those explosions are native deaths. That's actually how they die. No one else in Neverland dies this way. At least I don't think so. We never actually saw that kid hit the ground, but as far as I'm aware, it's just the natives. When you shoot or stab them, they explode into a puff of pastels. Well, what do you know? It's not every day you see the stupidest thing you've ever seen. So Blackbeard's ultimate goal is to find the hidden fairy kingdom so he can get all the pixum he'll ever need and live forever, and hopefully afford a better wig. But so far, he's been unable to find it. Have you tried checking your map? I would not be surprised if there was a section on their clearly labeled fairy territory. Eventually, they do find it, but they can't get in since they need a key. 
and Peter is apparently too stupid to realize he's been wearing the damn key the whole time. For fuck's sake, you only have to look at the shape of the keyhole. You bear the key. I do. I feel you, Blackbeard. I feel you. And upon entering the fairy kingdom, Blackbeard goes full red main. Wakey, wakey! Rise and shine! God bless Hugh Jackman. But Peter finally remembers how to fly, unites the fairies against the pirates, goes Super Saiyan, and takes out Blackbeard once and for all. Think happy thoughts. Wow, that line actually had a payoff. And sounded kind of badass. I'm impressed. But here's the thing. Peter doesn't actually do all that much in this fight. The fairies do almost all of the work, which means they pretty much could have kicked the pirates' asses anytime they wanted. What did they need Peter for? What is it about this kid that makes him their messiah? I don't get it. Anyway, they rescue the other orphans and they all live happily ever something. We'll always be friends, Hook, aren't we? Always. What could possibly go wrong? Well, this movie could bomb. And bomb it did. Critically and financially, it was one of the biggest failures of 2015. But I'll be damned if I didn't kind of enjoy this one. Though probably not for the reasons the filmmakers intended. It reminds me of Jupiter Ascending in that regard. Pan is stupid as hell, but it often goes into so bad it's good territory, especially whenever Jackman is on screen. I don't think I've had as much fun doing anything as Jackman clearly had while making this movie. But don't get me wrong, there are some aspects of this movie that are legitimately good. Wow. Levi Miller did a pretty good job as Peter Pan, and Adil Akhtar plays the comic relief character quite well. The environments look fantastic, and there were some legitimately funny moments here and there. How long have you known him? Three all my life. Oh really? You've known a boy half your age all your life. You thought they would buy that? I lied. I do that sometimes. It's called being a grown-up. And there are some things that are hit and miss, like the references to the original story. Some of them are pretty clever. This brief shot of Kensington Gardens was a nice touch, but some feel a bit forced. So the boy is lost? Yes, uh, he is a lost boy. Oh, shut up, Zorro. Some aspects were just disappointing. Hook and the crocodile are both in the movie, and I was hoping we'd get to see him lose his hand. And they tease it, but it doesn't actually happen. Weak. And speaking of Hook, there's this weird romance that develops between him and Tiger Lily that's just confusing. I have no idea why either of these two are attracted to each other. Tiger Lily is rather stoic and emotionless, and Hook is just a jerk. How the hell do these two fall for each other? I don't get it. Your Highness, I was hoping to get you alone. <sighs> oh, come on. I do not believe for one second that she found that cute. Overall, it's a pretty bad movie, but it has enough unintentional hilarity, and a bit of intentional hilarity, to make it entertaining. If you haven't seen it, I'd say give it a watch. Just make sure you go into this movie understanding that this will be nothing like the Peter Pan you grew up with. And it's gonna be weird. Really fucking weird. Next time, we're going to return to the world of found footage. And we just might regret that it was found in the first place. Until then, I am the Smeghead, and Hollywood can suck it. I've seen it. It's terrific.